Welcome to my series of videos on mathematics for economists. In this video, I would like to talk about complex numbers, uh, the set of complex numbers C. Um, we do encounter complex numbers in economic analysis, uh, for example, when we need to find eigenvalues for, uh, <clears throat> for a given matrix, uh, which can easily be complex even uh, if the uh, entries in the matrix are all real. Uh, but also if we look, for example, at uh, uh, a time series of economic variables and we're uh, interested in analyzing them in the frequency domain, that is, we want to know something about the spectrum of um, an economic variable as it uh, uh, evolves through time. So it is a good idea to have a, a basic understanding of complex numbers. We don't need to get too deeply into uh, into the analysis of functions of complex numbers, but we need to have some sort of basic understanding uh, uh, what complex numbers are all about. So the, the fundamental problem that uh, gives rise to, to complex numbers is the, so the solution to the equation x squared plus 1 equal to 0. Yeah, or then, of course, x squared equal to minus 1. Um, which, as we all know, does not have a, a solution in the, in the set of real numbers, or in R. And so we employ this, uh, what looks like a trick, uh, I put it in quotation marks here, so we introduce um, a symbol, which is the lowercase letter i, uh, and, and, and define this lowercase letter i such that i squared is equal to minus 1, and then, of course, we have a solution to, uh, um, to, this, to this equation. Uh, question, is it just a trick? Does, does this exist? Uh, so consider the multivariate version, version in, in, in R2 by 2. Yeah? Is there a matrix of two rows and two columns such that if we square this matrix, and we add the identity matrix, we get the zero matrix. Yeah? So, so we would take a generic 2 by 2 matrix in, uh, 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 so let's call the, the, coef the, the entries A11, A12, A21, A22. Uh, we add the identity in, um, uh, in R2 by 2, and we would get the zero matrix. Can we find something like that? Uh, we can. So uh, if you consider the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, and 0, and you square this matrix, uh, let's use our little scheme here. Uh, 0 times 0 plus uh, minus 1 times 1, that's minus 1. 0 times minus 1 is 0, plus minus 1 times 0 is 0. 1 times 0 is 0, plus 0 times 1 is 0, and 1 times minus 1 plus 0 times 0 is minus 1. So the resulting uh, product, or the resulting square of the matrix A, clearly is the negative identity. Right? So a square is the negative identity. So we can see uh, that in, uh, in the set of numbers uh, R2 by 2, the imaginary unit that solves the, uh, the, the equation A square plus I equal to 0 exists very naturally. We don't need to introduce a special symbol I or something to, to, to solve this equation. Uh, so it's really only a problem in the, in the one-dimensional set of real numbers R, where we need to uh, employ this trick and introduce the symbol. Uh, uh, as soon as we go to higher dimensions, it's actually, it's actually not a problem at all. So in that sense, I can maybe convey a bit of an intuition to you uh, that it's actually not too much of a trick to, to introduce the symbol I. Okay, so uh, let's define what a, what a complex number is.
complex number. Let's call it Z in the set of complex numbers. Is a pair of real numbers. And this pair is, uh, is combined to form the following sum. Z is A plus a i times b and a we call the real part of z and b we call the imaginary part of b yeah. note that both the real part and the imaginary part are real numbers we're looking at a pair a b and r square and we just multiply the imaginary part by the complex unit i and we sum the real and the imaginary part times i up to form the number z. i <coughs> corresponds to a particular complex number. Zero, one, or zero plus i times 1, which certainly is equal to dc. Ah, so this is a complex number. So in some sense there is an equivalence with r2 actually, only that um, we have to define a specific multiplication on, on r2 to get the set of complex numbers. Uh, let's first talk about addition of complex numbers though. Um, so if you want to add two complex numbers, let's call them a plus ib plus c plus id, then we get the sum of the real parts plus i times the sum of the imaginary parts. So that's very much straightforward. Multiplication behaves a bit differently because of this rule that i squared is equal to minus 1. So if we multiply a plus ib times c plus id, then we can just uh, we can just multiply this expression out. So we get a times c plus i times ad plus i times bc plus i squared times bd. And now i squared is equal to minus 1. And so uh, this, is, uh, this is negative 1. So I can write AC minus BD. Uh, this is now real because minus 1 certainly is real. Plus I times AD plus BC. This is the real part of the product. And this is the imaginary part of the product. So we just have the the multiplication that switches the sign because of i square equal to minus 1. We have a, a number of, um, uh, of other objects we can introduce in the context of uh, uh, complex numbers because they're just practical to, to have around. So one thing that we want to have is the complex conjugate. Um, so uh, let z be the complex number a plus ib and then we define the number z bar as a minus ib. So we only switch the sign on the imaginary part. Uh, then this number is called the complex conjugate. Complex conjugate of z. because we can identify a complex number in a sense with the vector consisting of the real and the imaginary part. So with the vector a, b, we can also talk about the length of the complex number. And this length we usually call the modulus or absolute value. So the number z modulus square root of a square 
plus b squared um, is called the absolute value or modulus of z. Yeah, and uh, this is geometrically very straightforward if you think about um, about a Cartesian coordinate system where you write the real part of the complex number on the x-axis and the imaginary part of the complex number on the y-axis and then say we have this point here in, in, in the complex plane that is given by the real part A and the imaginary part B. Uh, we can of course talk about AB as a vector and the length of that vector by Pythagoras, since this angle here is a right one, uh, would be uh, uh, the square root of a squared plus b squared. Note also that if you take z times its complex conjugate, so you consider the product a plus ib times a minus ib, uh, then you get a squared plus i times a times b minus i times a times b um, plus i times minus i, so this is minus i squared, now i squared is minus 1, so minus i squared is plus 1, uh, and so you get plus b squared. And this is therefore the square of the absolute value, or in other words, the absolute value is given by uh, the square root of z times the complex conjugate. Um, not really a definition, uh, but good to note here as well. Uh, what is the reciprocal of a given complex number? Yeah, so in some sense we want to have uh, uh, we want to have one over z. But, but then what does it mean to have the imaginary unit in the denominator? How can we write this? Well, uh, the idea is to multiply 1 over z by 1, and we write 1 a bit funny, namely by uh, complex conjugate z over complex conjugate z. Um, then we get uh, z over z times complex conjugate z, and this is, of course, the complex conjugate in the numerator is a minus ib. And now in the denominator, we have, as we saw here, um, uh, we have uh, z, z bar, and that's a square plus b square. And so now we have, and if you like, you can, of course, write this as a over a square plus b square minus i times b over a square plus b square where both the real and the imaginary part are real numbers, and so we have a perfectly well-defined um, complex number here in front of us. That is the reciprocal of z. Yeah. Um, of course, we can easily verify that it is the reciprocal of z by, uh, by multiplying z with the uh, z bar over z, z bar, and obviously we get 1, and so this is indeed the reciprocal. Okay, that's useful to know. Um, now, let's start with something completely different. Uh, let's look at the function exp of x or e to the x, the exponential function. And let's uh, Taylor expand this function. In the point x equal to 0. So you remember if you if you Taylor expand a function, uh, for example, this here, uh, what you do is you evaluate the function in a, in a support point here x equal to 0. And then you take the 
first derivative in the same point times x minus support point here 0 plus 1 half or 1 over 2 factorial times the second derivative in the support point here 0 times x minus support point square plus 1 over 3 factorial which is 6 1 over 6 times the third order derivative in the support point times x minus 0 cube and so on. Yeah. Um, well, let's do this here with, with our function. What is the derivative of e to the x up to the jth order is always e to the x. Yeah, so this is uh, this is for j. And if we evaluate this in 0, we always get e to the power of 0, which is 1. That makes this uh, expansion very easy. So we can write e to the x s, and now we evaluate in 0, so that's 1, plus uh, evaluate the derivative in 0, that's also 1, times x, so that's x, plus evaluate the second derivative in 0, that's also 1, times x squared divided by 2, plus evaluate the third derivative in 0, that's also 1, times x cubed divided by um, divided by 3 factorial. This here is also 2, is also 2 factorial because of course it's 2 times 1. Uh, and we keep going like this and so on. So we get uh, that we can write the exponential function as the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity over x to the power of n divided by n factorial. You may have seen the series expansion of the exponential function before. Okay, uh, let's still stick with something that apparently has nothing to do with complex numbers, but of course it has eminently to do with complex numbers, uh, as we will see in a minute. Uh, let's consider the function sine of x. Okay, so again we tailor expand in 0, so we can write sine of x as the sine in 0. Plus, and now we have the uh, first order derivative of the sine, which is the cosine, and we are supposed to evaluate it in 0, uh, times x minus 0 to the power of 1, which of course is just x. Um, now the third derivative of the, of the sine, so the first derivative is, sorry, the, the second derivative of the sine, so the first derivative is the cosine, uh, the second derivative is minus the sine. So we get minus one half times the sine, and now we need to evaluate them again in zero, times x minus the zero square, so that's just x square. Okay, so that was the second derivative. Now the third derivative. Uh, the derivative of the sine is again the cosine, but we need to keep the minus now, of course, because uh, uh, minus the derivative of minus sine is minus cosine. So one over 3 factorial cosine in 0, uh, x minus 0 to the power of 3, that's just x to the power of 3, and so on. So now we have minus the cosine. The derivative of the cosine is minus sine, so uh, minus minus now gives plus uh, 1 over 4 factorial times the sine in 0 times x minus 0 power 4, that's x to the power of 4. Uh, let me Give me one more, so now we have the sign again with a positive, uh, with a positive sign, and so therefore the uh, derivative is the cosine again with a positive sign, and then the sixth order term is going to switch the sign again. But I'm going to stop here because I'm sure you at this point think, yeah, okay, we got it. Um, so here I should actually write minus dot dot dot, but you get the, you get the idea. Um, and now, of course, since uh, 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 the sine in 0 is equal to 0 
and the cosine then zero is equal to one, we can write a bit more succinctly. Um, we get the cosine of zero times x, that's one times x, that's just x. Um, all the sine zero terms here, uh, they're equal to zero, so we're just left with the cosine zero terms. So we get minus one over three factorial times x cubed plus one over five factorial times x to the power of five. And then the next one would be minus one over seven factorial times x to the power of seven and so on. Yeah. Still, I have to ask for a bit of patience. One last function, consider the cosine. Cosine of x. Taylor series expansion, f of x, cosine of x, is, okay, everything in the support point zero. First derivative, minus the sine, then zero, times x. The derivative of minus sine is the, um, sorry, the derivative of uh, the sine is the cosine, uh, now we have um, um, uh, minus, so it's minus one half cosine of zero times x minus zero squared, so that's x squared. Uh, now we have the uh, derivative of the cosine, which is minus sine, and we have the minus sine, so minus minus gives plus. Here we switch one over three factorial times the sine evaluated in zero times x cubed. Of course, you can already say, well, why don't you even write them down? Sine of zero is zero. But we are just going through here very systematically, and we're going to, of course, eliminate this terms, these terms in a minute. Um, give me one more, one over minus, now we're switching again, one over five factorial sine of zero x to the power of five minus one over six factorial cosine of zero x to the power of six and so on. And so now, again, as here, sine of zero is zero and and cosine of zero is one. Uh, we get that we have um, that we have the cosine of zero, this is one. Um, all the sine terms here are equal to zero, so they are they don't play any role. So the next one is minus one half times x squared plus uh, one over four factorial times x to the power of four minus one over six factorial times x to the power of six. The next one would be plus one over eight factorial times x to the power of eight and so on. Okay. Where am I heading with this? Now consider f of x e to the i x. Now we want to study the exponential function in the imaginary numbers or with imaginary argument. Yeah. And so very straightforward if I take the derivative with respect to x then of course I get e to the i x times outer derivative is just the exponential function itself times the inner derivative which is now uh, just the coefficient i so I get i times e to the i x. chain rule. Second derivative with respect to x. i is just a coefficient, so I just take the derivative of e to the i x again, which is i times e to the i x, so I get i square times e to the i x. Now i square is equal to minus 1, so this is minus e to the i third order derivative. Take the 
derivative of minus e to the i x with respect to i. Well, this is minus i e to the i x. Fourth order derivative. The derivative of minus i times e to the i x with respect to x. This is minus i square e to the i x, which, since i square is minus 1, is e to the i x. And at this point, of course, it becomes periodic, because now I'm going into uh, i e to the i x again, and so now I start to cycle, and they all look the same. Yeah. So these are the these are the four different um, derivatives or uh, functions that that occur. Well, what are they evaluated in zero? Evaluated in x equal to 0, e to the i x is always equal to 1. So the first derivative evaluated in 0 is i. The second derivative evaluated in 0 is minus 1. The third derivative evaluated in 0 is minus i. The fourth derivative evaluated in 0 is plus 1. And then the fifth derivative evaluated in 0 again is i and it is periodic from there on and it's just cycling through these uh, four values. So if we Taylor expand this function in the support point 0 again, I'm just writing the Taylor expansion here now in zero, so it has this nice succinct form that the x term to power is always just x itself. That's supposed to be x cube. Oh, yeah, x cube. Um, plus, just uh, bear with me here for a moment. I'm writing a few more terms. And so on. Um, then, with our table here, with our uh, derivatives evaluated in uh, x equal to 0, we see that this is, well, um, the function e to the i x evaluated in 0, that's of course just 1, um, plus first derivative in 0, that is i times x. Then we get the second derivative evaluated in 0, that's minus 1. So I get minus 1 half x squared, no i here. Then the third derivative evaluated in 0, this is minus i, so I get minus again, 1 over 3 factorial. Now I have an i and I have an x cube. The fourth derivative evaluated in 0 is 1, so I get a plus 1 over 4 factorial, I have no i, and just x to the power of 4. The fifth uh, is, uh, is just is i, and uh, so I get plus 1 over 5 factorial i times x5, and so on, so 1 over 6 factorial x to the power of 6 minus 1 over 7 factorial i times x to the power of 7, and it keeps going like this. Now, I can organize this expression a bit differently in the sense that I write all the terms that involve i and all the terms that do not involve i separately, right? So I get, if I collect first all those that do not involve i, I get 1 minus 1 half x squared plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the 4 minus 1 over 6 factorial x to the 6 and so on. All the terms without i and then I write plus i times all the terms that involve i. So this would be um, starting with um, starting with x here x then minus 
it's not so nice. Huh? Let me uh, let me give a bit more space here. Corner times x minus one over three factorial x cube, and then the fifth order term plus one over five factorial x to the power of five minus one over seven factorial x to the power of seven, and so on. And now you see where this is going. Um, this is what we've just found to be the Taylor expansion of the cosine of x, and this is what we've just found to be the Taylor expansion of the sine of x. Um, and so we get one of the central relations of the exponential function and the trigonometric function in, uh, if we allow for, for complex arguments, e to the i x is the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. This is Euler's formula. And now we can study complex numbers in the unit circle because we can deal with the cosine and the sine. And uh, of course, uh, we know that we can consider the cosine and sine in the unit circle. So um, let me um, let me make an honest to God attempt at drawing the situation and any shortcomings in my drawing abilities again. You have to, um, you have to compensate uh, in your mind, which you can easily do. So that's on the on the x-axis, right? The real part of z and the cosine of theta. Well, here we wrote x, but we can call an angle theta, that's uh, quite common to give an angle a, a Greek letter. That's right on the y-axis, the imaginary part, uh, and the sine of theta. Um, let's say that we have a, that we have a number a, b, which is complex. Um, <clears throat> so we can represent it as a vector a, b. Uh, let's call this number z. We know that the length of z, or the absolute value of z, is the square root of a square plus b square. Let's call this absolute value r for radius, right? Um, so then we can draw, well, I can't really, but, but, but I'm still going to try. We can draw a, a circle through the point Z. Um, so yeah, it's a semicircle now with radius R, or my attempt at a semicircle, but you know what I mean. Uh, so this is, the, this is the radius R. And um, uh, we can write um, uh, we can uh, now also uh, uh, plot the unit circle here. Um, the unit circle, of course, is radius one. So let's assume that that r is bigger than one. Of course, there can also be cases where r is smaller than one, but let's agree that r is bigger than one. Uh, so I draw the unit circle smaller. Yeah? So I, I just draw a, a unit circle here for my... Uh, uh, it's a bit too far off. Better. Uh, so that's my unit circle. So here I have a, I have a shortened version of my vector AB. Uh, points in the same direction but has uh, uh, only length 1. Uh, and of course now I can call the angle um, here theta. Um, I have uh, have a length of uh, of one here, which I should maybe um, 
which I should maybe write it here. Um, and so I can now here plot my uh, cosine of theta and I can here plot my sine of theta. Those are my cosine and sine uh, in the unit circle. Yeah, and then, um, of course, uh, we measure the uh, theta here, we measure in radians, not, not in degrees. Yeah, so, so um, uh, a full rotation is, uh, is so maybe I should write a different color. When you write in green, a full rotation would be 2 pi. Uh, a quarter rotation would be would be pi half. Uh, Semi-circle, 180 degrees, would be pi. Um, 3 quarters um, of a circle, uh, 270 degrees, would be 3 half pi. Uh, and so uh, we uh, evaluate the trigonometric functions in radians. Then I can write my coordinates A and B, which are the, the Cartesian coordinates of the complex number Z, as R times the cosine of theta. And I can write B as R times the sine of theta. Yeah, so that, uh, that the vector AB is r times cosine theta and r times sine theta and uh, or if you will r times cosine theta and sine theta and then the length of the vector cosine theta and sine theta is equal to one and the length of ib therefore is r and uh, this is the geometric situation we're looking at. Um, this tells us that we can Therefore, write every complex number um, as, as r times cosine of theta plus i times sine of theta. Or, since we now have the Euler formula still standing up there at our disposal, this is r times e to the i theta. And these are the so-called polar coordinates. Um, so we have a, a, a correspondence between the Cartesian coordinates A and B, uh, which express uh, intercepts on the x-axis and the z-axis, and the polar coordinates R and theta, which express an angle and a radius, alternatively, which of course also uniquely identify every point on the plane. And of course, uh, uh, of course, the, the length or the absolute value of z is equal to not to one, but equal to r. Okay. Now, e to the i x uh, because of this. Uh, consideration, of course, is 2 pi periodic. Yeah. It is on the unit circle. So it needs an absolute value of e to the i x because it's cosine, uh, cosine x plus i times the sine of x. And so the length is the square root of cosine square plus sine square, and that's always one, and so the square root of one is also one, so it's on the unit circle. And e to the i pi is the cosine of pi plus i times the sine of pi. And now I have to scroll back to show you in pi, which is here. The sine is equal to zero and the cosine is equal to minus one. Sine is equal to zero, cosine is minus one. 
So this is 1, because the sine is equal to 0. Um, minus 1, sorry. Uh, because the cosine is, uh, of pi is minus 1. Um, and this gives us e to the i pi plus 1 is equal to 0. This famous equation that involves uh, uh, just about every significant number uh, we can think of, e, i, pi, 1, and 0. Okay. Uh, that's kind of for the for the beauty of things. A bit more for practical matters. Um, uh, we can also recover the usual addition formula for trigonometric functions. So the uh, sine of x plus y and the cosine of x plus y. And I'm going to show you um, that this is a very straightforward calculation once you have the Euler formula, addition formula for trigonometric functions. Yeah, so how do we do this? Well, we simply evaluate e to the i x plus y. This by Euler is the cosine of x plus y plus, y plus i times the sine of x plus y. But it is also by the exponential uh, function e to the ix times e to the iy. And e to the ix times e to the iy is again by Euler the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x times the cosine of y plus i times the sine of y. And you know what we can uh, multiply this uh, this product out here so we get the cosine of x times the cosine of y plus i times the cosine of x times the sine of y plus i times the sine of x times the cosine of y uh, minus the sine of x times the sine of y and now we can of course uh, collect our collect our real and imaginary parts here. So we get the cosine of x times the cosine of y minus the sine of x times the sine of y uh, plus i times the cosine of x times the sine of y plus the sine of x times the cosine of y. And now we can just compare with our real and imaginary parts here and we find that um, of course here we have the real part so this equals the cosine of x plus y and there you find your trigonometric addition formula that you probably have seen before and here we find the sine of x plus y and accordingly, if you do the same thing for e to the i times x minus y, then you get bar Euler that this equals the cosine of x minus y plus i times the sine of x minus y. Um, but it, by the exponential function, it is also equal to e to the i x times e to the minus i y. And so this again by Euler is equal to cosine of x plus i times sine of x uh, times cosine of y minus i times sine of y. And now you multiply this out and what you get is, as you can easily convince yourself, uh, you get a, um, you get a real part that reads cosine x, cosine y, plus sine x, sine y, and you get an imaginary part that reads sine x, cosine y, minus cosine x, sine y. And so this is your, um, this is your real part, which is 
cosine of x minus y and this here is your imaginary part which is sine of x minus y. Yeah? So uh, once you have Euler the derivation of these uh, addition formula is pretty straightforward. Uh, I think this is about the uh, uh, what I want to t say about uh, complex numbers here. I think if you have these things down, you can do a lot uh, in in uh, economic analysis and in mathematics for economists with complex numbers. So uh, thank you very much for watching.